3,000 people had pledged their support on social media. In the end, 300 showed up. And they were outnumbered two to one by police. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And it's now three weeks since the death of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police. But in Australia, protests continue with stern warnings about the threats to health from the Prime Minister and this earlier one from Finance Minister Matthias Cormann. I think it is incredibly selfish, it's incredibly self-indulgent and yes, I mean, it does uh, impose uh, unnecessary and unacceptable risk on to the community. Some Australians might agree with that judgement, but there are plenty who found Cormann's condemnation offensive, as Yahoo News reported. Indigenous Labor MP Ann Arley responded to Mr Cormann's comments, suggesting his state of WA is part of the problem of police brutality against Aboriginal citizens. It was a punchy quote, and according to Yahoo, Ann Arley went on to support the protesters by saying... I think many people saw the issue of death in custody as something that is important to speak out about now in Australia. But there were just a couple of things wrong with this story. First, Dr Ali is not Indigenous. She's Egyptian-born. And second, she never actually said those things. As you'll see, they're from Indigenous Labor MP Linda Burney, who, we don't need to tell you, is a completely different person. Many people saw the issue of deaths in custody as something that is important to speak out about now in Australia. So, what do Bernie and Ali have in common? Well, they're both female Labor MPs of colour. But as Anne Ali told MediaWatch... A quick Google search is all that's needed for anyone to know I am not an Indigenous Australian. So how did Yahoo News get the pair mixed up and leave the story up for five days until we contacted them? Could they not tell the two MPs apart? We're not sure, but Yahoo has now apologised and told us... This was an unfortunate mistake. No doubt it was an innocent one too, but it does make a point about the lack of racial diversity in Australian politics and the media. And indeed in the almost all-white Canberra press gallery. Last week, ABC Insiders spent a chunk of time discussing the issues facing Indigenous Australians in the wake of the Black Lives Matter protests. And the first issue David Spears came up with was this. I think we should probably start this conversation by pointing out none of us are Indigenous. We can't fully appreciate you know, the daily lives of those living with disadvantage and discrimination. Now, the ABC could easily have fixed that problem by inviting on an Indigenous panellist. They do exist, you know. And after a torrent of criticism, they did that yesterday, giving a seat to the ABC's former Indigenous Affairs reporter, Bridget Brennan, who promptly told them what many had already said. It's not good enough anymore, particularly at this moment, but I would say any week, to have a panel of white people speaking about issues uh, when there is very little lived experience of discrimination and racism uh, on that panel. Sad to say, this lack of diversity on the insider's couch is nothing new. Last week, news website Junkie audited Insider's panels for at least the past 10 years and found that the program... ..has not featured a person of colour on its panel in at least a decade, and possibly never. And as Brennan points out, whitewashing panellists is a particular problem when discussing racial issues, especially when journalists make comments like this one from Greg Sheridan on Sky. I myself have lived in the United States on four separate occasions and I never saw any racial confrontation. I never heard anyone make a racist remark. That really is a remarkable claim. And we wonder if Greg Sheridan's hearing is any better in Australia, where his News Corp colleague Peter Gleeson suggested yesterday in the Sunday Telegraph that the greatest danger to Aboriginals and Negroes, yes, that's right, Negroes, is themselves. While another News Corp columnist, Andrew Bolt, last week called Melbourne anti-racism protesters hypocritical savages. We've no doubt the word savages was carefully chosen. But why on earth would Bolt choose it? And why would his editors let him? Bolt famously lost one racial discrimination case in 2011 when he accused light-skinned people who identified as Aboriginal of doing so for personal gain. After his latest comments, could another one be on the way? And, talking of the courts, let's go to some important legal news you may have missed. Concerning the secret trial of a former ACT Attorney General, Bernard Caleri, who spoke exclusively to Media Watch over the weekend. I just sat there in court um, thinking on occasion, uh, um, are we in Moscow? This was a most important uh, part of uh, a trial uh, being heard in, in camera, outside the gaze of the world. And uh, I felt uh, this is not my country. So what is all this about? 
Well, if you switched onto Canberra's 7pm news on 25th of May, which most of the country did not, you would have caught this brief explainer. A secret hearing has begun in the spy case against Canberra lawyer Bernard Kaliri. Protesters who turned up to support Mr Kaliri were undeterred by physical distancing rules. He's been charged with conspiring with former senior intelligence officer Witness K to reveal details of an Australian spying operation in East Timor. The hearing will determine what evidence to be used against him in a future trial should remain classified due to national security concerns. That 30-second snippet was the only TV report on the first day of that secret hearing. And since then, the ABC has not been back to check on progress. Meanwhile, there's been nothing at all on 7, 10 or SBS, and also nothing we can see in The Age, Sydney Morning Herald, Daily Mail, the websites of 9, 7 and the ABC, and The Australian until this morning, although it was covered on ABC Radio. Now, to be fair, the court was closed to the media, but surely that was worth reporting. And Crikey, The Guardian and Canberra Times all did so, revealing that Caleri had handed out a statement to journalists on the steps of the court to say... I am unable to say much and you are unable to report much. This is the state of our now fragile democracy. This weekend, Caleri was a bit more forthcoming to Media Watch, telling me why he believes the government wants evidence in his case to remain secret. I've said many, many times, I'm on trial uh, and partly in camera because this is a coalition government with dirty political linen and it needs that linen hidden. The law being used to hide Caleri's evidence is a powerful piece of legislation called the National Security Information Act 2004, which allows entire trials to be held away from public view. And in another secret prosecution of an intelligence officer known as Witness J, whose conviction was discovered only by chance, that is exactly what happened. As The Guardian's Christopher Norse told us earlier this month... Every facet of this case was kept secret. You know, we don't know who he is, what his background is. We don't know the nature of his sentence. You know, we know that he was imprisoned in Canberra, but we've only found that about that after the fact. So it was so secret that even... The Justice Minister and the ACT just had no idea about this case whatsoever until it, it happened to become public. In the Caleri case, we do at least know he's on trial and what he's charged with. And it all dates back to 2004, when Australia secretly and illegally bugged East Timorese government offices in Dili to gain an unfair advantage in negotiations about oil and gas in the Timor Sea, a fact that Caleri revealed dramatically to the Australian in 2013. So it was a Watergate situation. They broke in and they bugged. In a total breach of sovereignty, the Cabinet Room, the ministerial offices of then Prime Minister Mar al Khatiri and his government. They placed clandestine listing devices in the ministerial conference room. Shortly after those revelations and an interview on ABC Lateline, Kaleri's home and office were raided by the AFP, as was the home of a senior ACES officer known as Witness K, who had complained about the bugging to the intelligence watchdog and then been sidelined and who had engaged Kaleri as his lawyer. But it took another four and a half years before both men were secretly charged with sharing classified information. And we only discovered that because Andrew Wilkie MP revealed it under parliamentary privilege in June 2018. Now the NSI Act is being used to keep the trials of Kaleri and Witness K secret too, which Attorney General Christian Porter maintains is perfectly normal. Now, you know, there are court cases all the time where some matters are not made public. I mean, that's, that in itself is not terribly unusual. But it is unusual. Indeed, former Supreme Court Judge Anthony Wheelie QC, who's an expert on the NSI Act, told Four Corners last year... This could be, in a strange way, one of the most secretive trials in Australian history. There are some obvious national security matters where protection is required, but where... Where is the national security elsewhere in the proceedings? And because that's being shrouded in secrecy, it becomes much more secretive than a terrorist trial or something of that nature. Caleri says he has no intention of revealing names of spies or operational details in open court. And he agrees that some evidence in the trial should be heard in secret. If it becomes relevant, the identity of any of the players, techniques, dates, times, places, any of that matter uh, uh, can be uh, suppressed. There's no issue there. This is not a proceeding where we're trying to uh, 
bring information forward of any sensational nature other than the core issue of what happened. And who would be embarrassed if it were to be made public? I'm not able to traverse that because of the restrictions I'm under under the National uh, NSI Act. I, I can't answer that. Of course, I would dearly love to. Kaleri alleges that our government and former Foreign Minister Alexander Downer behaved improperly in the 2004 negotiations and he wants the details to be canvassed in open court. And one of Australia's leading advocates, Brett Walker QC, agrees that it is in the public interest that we know what's being tried. And that's particularly so where the whole case concerns uh, a, a, a supposed or alleged concern that there has been misbehaviour, uh, maladministration or worse, uh, by Australian authorities. Every Australian, I imagine, uh, is interested to know that Australian authorities will be held to account. That's difficult to do if a trial at the pointy end uh, will be held secretly. Now, it is of course possible that Judge David Mossop could go against the AG's advice and decide to hear all the evidence in Caleri's trial in open court. But he's required under Section 31.8 of the NSI Act to, quote, give greatest weight to the AG's arguments about national security. So it's clear what side the law wants him to come down on. What the arguments are, we do not know, and the judge has yet to give a decision. But Channel 9 was brave enough to file a 20-second report on day three of the hearing, identifying one of the witnesses. Former Foreign Minister Gareth Evans has given evidence in a secret trial in Canberra today. We don't know what Evans said, and we couldn't tell you if we did. And others weren't so brave. Sydney law firm Xenophon Davis tweeted this photo of Evans coming to court, then took it down after being warned they might be in breach of the law. And The Guardian also decided not to risk naming witnesses and simply reported... Intelligence leaders, diplomats and former ministers lingered briefly in the waiting area of the oddly quiet ACT Supreme Court before entering a room where journalists could not follow. All in all, it's a bizarre state of affairs, but arguably also a scandal, in which the government stands accused of using national security laws to avoid political embarrassment. Now, we don't know if that charge is true, because we're not being allowed to judge. And the Attorney-General's office declined to answer detailed questions and merely stated it wants to see as much of the trial as possible, whatever that means, in open court. Meanwhile, as a former Chief Law Officer, Bernard Caleri appears to be a man of principle and integrity, who is angry about the years of secrecy and baffled by the prosecution. Who and why is this being driven? We should know that. I should know that. Uh, we've just got a summons. It's faceless. Who is driving this? Who wants to jail me and why? And what's the answer? I don't know. My family don't know. It's a bad dream. It, it's uh, ruined my practice and everything I've worked for. Be different if I felt that I'd done something wrong. It's sheer, unadulterated, vindictive injustice as far as I'm concerned. We'll post a full interview with Bernard Clary on our website as soon as we can. And as far as we're able, we'll keep you up to date with his case. But finally, let's go to the top end, where politics is often dark and stormy, and hear from the NT Chief Minister, Michael Gunner. We're doing the press conference here because I don't support web pages sponsored by hate pages. I've called out that behaviour as offensive before, and I'll never support it. So we're going to do the press conference here from Parliament House. So, why did the Chief Minister retreat to the bunker? And why is journalist Chris Walsh returning fire? This is truly remarkable and, uh, you know, I've been a journalist for 20 years in Canada and over here in Australia and I've, I've never seen anything like what happened today. Darwin's Chris Walsh has worked as a political reporter for the NT News and a producer at the ABC. But now he's the editor of a smaller online startup called NT Independent, which kicked off in March, promising much-needed diversity in local news. And he claims, when he showed up for an announcement by the Chief Minister, he was told to bugger off. One of their media advisors approached me as we were waiting and the cameras were being set up and said, you know, you've been told by this government that you can't attend this press conference. So the presser was hastily switched to Parliament House and Walsh was shut out there too. And it's not the first time the new media player has been shut out by the Labour government. Back in April, only one month after it started, the NT Independent was blocked from attending press conferences and from seeking information from government departments to report to the public. Banned from seeking information. That is crazy. 
And it's been silence ever since, despite pleas for access by both Walsh and the media union, which demanded the NT government... ..lift any embargoes on providing information and accreditation to attend media events and parliamentary sittings to the journalists of the NT Independent. Last week, the ABC also went into bat for the new kid on the block, hitting up the Labour leader with this question. Chief Minister, what are you going to do about the NT Independent? Hold every press conference inside, in Parliament House, and hope they go away? I don't support hate pages. I'm very clear about that. And I'll um, have press conferences with legitimate media. So, what's all the fuss about a hate page? Well, it appears it's not about any of the Independent's reporting, or even about editor Walsh. Rather, in a sign of the times, it's about a Facebook page run by the owner of The Independent, local businessman Owen Pike. And that is certainly critical of Gunner's government, with stuff like this... ..and this. But it was a comment about one of the government's female ministers last year that really pissed Michael Gunner off, as the NT News reported. Did Lauren's Moss get hot? Mr Pike wrote below a photograph of Ms Moss door-knocking in her Casuarina electorate. Gunner called it disgraceful. But Pike insisted he'd been misinterpreted, saying... I was not being sexist. I was referring to her hair. Michael has to harden up and stop being so sensitive. He has completely overreacted. Yep, the ban on NT Independent is about the owner's adolescent Facebook page that pokes fun at the government and its ministers. But Owen Pike is not letting up. As he told MediaWatch... I can't believe a bogan who runs a Facebook page can send the whole Northern Territory government into hiding. It's farcical. What they're really scared of is independent news and Chris Walsh. This government doesn't want the scrutiny of a new player. Walsh tells us he has complete editorial control and would not have taken the job without it. But the government says it doesn't believe him and the publication will remain in the doghouse. It is crazy stuff and they really do need to sort this out. That's all from us tonight. Don't forget Media Bytes every Thursday on your favourite social media platform. But for now until next week, goodbye. Mm -hmm.